Good morning, Emmanuel members and friends. Welcome to our service this morning. It's the fifth Sunday after Pentecost, and we'll begin our service with the call to worship that you'll see on the screen before you. Oh God, we gather together in your presence with expectation, hungry for an encounter with you, eager to hear your word. Open our eyes and ears to your presence of your Holy Spirit. May the seeds of your word scattered among us this morning fall on fertile soil. May we take root in our hearts and lives and produce an abundant harvest of good words and deeds. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our teacher and our Lord. Amen. We begin with our Kyrie. In peace, in peace, let us pray to the Lord, have mercy, Christ, have mercy, Lord, have mercy, for the reign of God, and for peace throughout the world, for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord, have mercy, Christ, have mercy. Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. 
We continue with our gathering hymn, Lord, let my heart be good soil, hymn number 512. You are in the spirit, 
since the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies also through his spirit that dwells in you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Emmanuel members and friends, this is my sermon for Matthew chapter 13. As a pastor, when you are giving a sermon um, in, in a congregation or wherever else, you are speaking to people that come from all different sorts of backgrounds. It's actually quite staggering when you stop to think about it. Each person comes with their own experiences that shape um, how they will receive the message. Some people are blue collar people. Some people are white collar. Some people grew up far away and sort of are Montana transplants. Some people have been living here and have been working on the family ranch since they were four. Some people come with differing political and social views, different perspectives on Christianity. Maybe they've been Lutheran their entire life, or maybe they grew up a different denomination and have come into our church. But it's the same message that I give for each person. It's the same message that I cast out. I don't curate it for each person that comes in. And any preacher would tell you that as we prepare our sermon, we think about the people that are coming into our congregation. And we wonder how it will land for them, how it will impact their lives, hoping that it will land in the hearts of the hearer in such a way that it will impact their lives. 
that they'll see it matters for them. Because, of course, it's not that I'm trying to proclaim my own message, but I'm trying to be faithful to the message that Jesus gave me to proclaim as I pour over the scriptures week after week. But the question becomes, week after week, how will it land? How will this message land in the hearts of the hearers that come from a variety of different places and perspectives? This week I was also preparing for mixed funeral, and funeral services sort of magnify this idea even more so. You have people coming from all the different perspectives, even more diverse backgrounds than a Sunday service, and I'm not so sure that many of the people there at the service wouldn't just prefer that I kept the whole God part out of it. They would rather just uh, acknowledge and think about the loved one that passed away. And yet there before them, I cast out my message to every single person the same message, wondering how it will land in their hearts. But as I was thinking about the parable this week, and I was thinking about the sower who extravagantly takes the seed and casts it out in every direction, almost as, almost as if he doesn't almost if he doesn't care where it lands, maybe that's the beauty of this kingdom message that Jesus proclaims, and the one that I'm called to proclaim as well. Maybe that's the shocking part, is that he doesn't go around picking and choosing who is worthy of the message. There is no hierarchy for who deserves to hear it, or who which person deserves more seed or less seed. It's the same message for every person. It's the same seed. It's the same message if you've been a Christian your whole life, or two minutes. It's the same promise, it's the same hope delivered to us. If you, feel, if you feel like you've lived a pretty good life, and you feel like you're a pretty righteous person, you may not say that out loud, but in your hearts you think that. And it's the same message if you feel like you are weighed down by your sins and past mistakes, and sometimes they feel like they have a hold on you. It's the same message for both those people. It's the same message if you are black, brown, or white, male or female, old or young, blue collar, white collar. As Paul will say in Galatians, it's the same message if you are male or female, Jew or Gentile, slave or free. It's the same message. It's the same extravagant, grace-filled seed cast out to every person, and it doesn't pay attention to societal boundaries and hierarchy. And it's the same message that is for you. Whether you receive it or not, it's still there, and it is still for you. It's for you, no matter who you are, no matter your life experiences. That doesn't shape it. It's still for you. Jesus' kingdom is for you. And so if it's the same seed, meaning it's the same message of Jesus' saving kingdom, then it's really all about the soil, isn't it? The soil that the seed finds itself in. That's what the parable is about that Jesus gives for us this morning. Jesus' story goes in progressing order as the soil gets better and better. First, we see some seeds that fell on the ground, on the road, but some birds ate them up. They didn't produce on the worn down path. Then some seeds fell on rocky ground, and although they started to spring up, the, the message didn't have root. It didn't go deep into the hearts of the hearer. Then, in the next parable, others fell on thorny ground. And when they did come up, they were choked by the circumstances of life, Jesus said. And then finally, some fell on good soil, rich soil. And they grew roots, and they produced an abundant crop. And I think the question that this parable asks us is, um, maybe what you're thinking about is, what makes good soil? And can I make myself into good soil, at least better soil, to as to receive this message? And we may wonder, is it that people were more righteous than others and that made them better soil? Is that, the, is that they were better people, and so they were uh, able to grow more? That's kind of the often understanding. If I'm just a better person, that will please God. 
that will produce more things with my relationship with God if I just do the right thing. Or maybe it's the fact that they were a certain type of demographic. Was it that the people were rich enough, uh, smart enough, they had uh, enough talent? No. Look at the parable. No, it's the same as the explanation before. It's know that they trusted in the words of Jesus. That's the only difference in the soil. Do we trust and hold on to the message of Jesus? That's what makes us into good soil. This too, like the seed cast it out, is at the very same time very simple and yet very powerful. What makes you good soil and receptive to the kingdom message is not what you can do to make yourself into it, but it's about who you put your trust in, who you put your life into, so that you can receive that message. Christian apologist C.S. Lewis, in his book Surprised by Joy, describes his conversion back to Christianity um, later on in life. At the age of 17, um, Lewis wrote to his friend Arthur Greaves, saying, I believe in no religion. There is absolutely no proof for any of them. And really, from a philosophical standpoint, Christianity is not even the best. You, you have to understand, though, um, Lewis's life experiences to, how, to see how he ended up there at the age of 17. When he was a boy, he lived in a love-filled house. He describes it as a great childhood. But tragically, at the age of nine, his mother passed away. And he writes that when his mother passed away, he in essence lost his father as well, who, who couldn't cope with the loss of his wife. And so those life experiences um, changed how he grew up in the faith. He, he fell away from the church as he was sent to boarding school along with his brother. But while he was new to Oxford as a professor, he started to have these long and difficult conversations with colleagues. Christian colleagues, including J.R.R. R. Tolkien, the author of The Lord of the Rings. And it was through these long conversations that Lewis was drawn back to Christianity and to his faith. In fact, there is this great quote that I want to share with you that describes his feelings in that moment. Lewis says this in the book, You must picture me alone in that room at Oxford, night after night, feeling whenever my mind was lifted from my work for even a second, there was the steady, unrelenting approach of God, whom I so earnestly desired not to meet. That which I greatly feared had at last come upon me, and in that term of school term of 1929, I finally gave in and admitted that God was God, and I knelt and prayed. Perhaps that night I was the most dejected and reluctant convert in all of England. Lewis's story, like many others, reminds me that sometimes it takes years and years for that seed of faith that is planted in our hearts to take root. That faith doesn't come automatically for, for many of us. Whether because of life circumstances like what Lewis went, Lewis went through or different reasons. We go through all of them, and sometimes we are like the hard path, hard and beaten down by life circumstances, unable to grow. Or maybe the thorns of life, meaning we spent years and years pursuing these empty dreams of, of money and reputation, giving our love away to so many different other things, only to find that we've been choked to death in this life that we've chosen. And finally, we are more receptive to the message that's really been planted in our hearts since we were very young. But that seed was always there, wasn't it? It was always being planted by those around us working in our lives, wanting it to grow in our hearts. And finally, years after years, we finally hear those saving words of Jesus anew for the first time, and they take root. You see, it's the same message of hope for every single person, and it's for you. Regardless of when you are able to receive it, regardless of the circumstances in your life, it is for you, no matter what you've done. And so we pray 
in the various journeys of our, Lord, of our lives, Lord, let my heart be good soil. Let me put all my, tro my trust and hope in you, in your kingdom message. Help it to shape my life. Help me to grow into abundant harvest, where I can spread my seed, my faith, to those around me. Like a wheat field, growing and the seed spreads in the wind, the Holy Spirit spreads our seeds of faith throughout the world, relying on the faith, the giver of the one who gave us that faith. And so may our hearts become fertile soil for the gospel message. Let it shape us, help us to grow, help us to root our lives in Christ, regardless of what is going on in the world, regardless of what is going on in our lives. And I think the prayer of the day says it well, and I want to end with that. The prayer of the day says, By your Holy Spirit, receive it with joy. Receive the gospel message with joy. Live according to it, and grow in faith and hope and love. But who? But through who? Who do we live this life through? Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, the giver of the message that is for everyone, that is for you. So may God bless you, and may we take root in that message, the message that is saving our world. Amen.
join me in the words our Savior gave us, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Continue with the prayers of the church. Called into unity with one another and all of creation, let us pray for the world, let us pray for the church, and let us pray for all those who are in need, especially those on our hearts this morning. Donna Eddie Hanley and family, Donna Georgia Schaefer and Terry Miller, Rod Brawley, Patty and Robert Mitchell. The family of Sandy Armagost. Pastor Jake, Mandy, Henry, and Lucas. Shirley Schatz. My brother Art. Abiding God, we pray that you would care for all those who are in need, especially those loved ones and places in our hearts this morning. For those who are doubting, renew their faith. For those who are worrying, provide release. For those who are struggling, ease their burdens. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. God, in God, we pray this morning for our nation and our world. We are so often divided when we should be coming together. We are hurting each other instead of seeking the best for our neighbors. Turn us back into your kingdom way. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Gracious God, your word has been sown in many places. We pray for the missionaries and ministries of your church around the world, including our church here at Emmanuel. We pray for the missions of food banks, shelters, Lutheran World Relief, and those responding to this COVID crisis. Inspire us to be witnesses of the faith that we share together. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Finally, God, we pray for our world. We pray for those who are lacking food and shelter right now. We pray for farmers and ranchers that provide sustenance to our world. We especially pray for those who have lost work or are underemployed right now. We pray for those who are putting their lives at risk in returning to work. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Rejoicing in hope, Holy God, we lift up the prayers of our hearts to you, the prayers that you know, trusting that you receive them in care. And we end our prayers of intercession with the Lord's Prayer we'll say together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We'll continue in the service with our offering. Thank you for all those who are sending their offering in and continue to support the mission of the church as a way that we worship together. You'll see on the screen before you where you can send that in. And uh, we'll continue in the service with our offering song, We Give Thee But Thine Own. 
hymn number 686. Thank you. 